the geodesic design was was absolutely new. As far as I know, George Yates was the first ever to utilize the geodesic. And he did some of the most beautiful work ever done. And in those days, geodesic produced the lightest weight structural entity that was that had ever been built at that time. In other words, it had the lowest weight for the greatest strength values ever produced by anyone, anywhere. Now, this was all done without engineers. Mm -hmm. The ships were uh, beha behaved beautifully. They had no, no bad flight characteristics uh, that, that I know of at all. In fact, on an all-around airplane, I think that Yates's geodesic airplane was years and years ahead of itself. And the Stiper, by the way, is the airplane at which Yates built, had a Martin four-cylinder, 120 horsepower engine, and this is the plane he used to teach several of us to fly. In fact, there was three, three people involved in the training program that I was involved in at the time I worked with him. There was Gilbert and Buswell and Pulsiver who all learned to fly that same spring and we used to have quite a contest. Mm -hmm. And Yates made it possible. The interesting thing about it is one day I asked Mr. Yates some just a year or two ago I went and talked to, with George for old time's sake and was talking about the licenses and things and I said well one thing about it you never had a license in your life I guess. And but he says that isn't true. He says he went and got a little packet out of his keepsakes and he says, look at this, and he had a license signed by Orville Wright. <laughs> and it was uh, signed uh, one of the, as a member of the Federal Aeronautics International. The Stifer of Detsis flew all the time. It did have a metal prop, which was really nice to have. Most propellers were wooden. And uh, it also had four exhaust stacks, it was an inverted Martin engine in it, four cylinder. The four exhaust stacks pointed straight down. When that fl thing would fly over, it really did roar. Uh, it was a loud airplane, very loud. Without looking, you always knew when it was in the air. I remember the event of the day was usually George Yates uh, getting into the Stiper when it became dusk and flying over the field, coming on down uh, side slip, bounce the tail on the ground a couple times, <laughs> and take off again. One Sunday he came over to me and I had said to Fred, I hope George never asked me to fly. I know he's a good pilot, but I would be a little nervous. So sure enough, here came George one Sunday evening, threw me the helmet and said, come on, Mark, we're going flying. Uh, when we got up, he said, it's all yours. And of course, I'd never flown. I guess I did a pretty good job because we're still here. But uh, he did come down, he did side slip, and uh, on up, which was really a thrill. Did you fly with George Yates again? Yes, yes. And we had a lot of fun here. <clears throat> I don't know of anything that's any more fun. Everything is geodetic now, as far as I'm concerned. Geodetic gives you what you need right now, see? Mm -hmm. And we didn't have any uh, failures in it. Uh, I don't say you can't crack it up, but you can crack it up without getting killed instantly, because it bounces. And this airport got quite famous, just from mouth to mouth. Hmm. And they began to bring in their old planes in because uh, we uh, we could revamp them, you know, and make better planes out of them. We uh, would maybe work on it and fix it up. I think everybody connected with this little field that they all think that there's something should be still be done about it. See? Otherwise, it would just disappear in the past. He'd taken feet off of the wings and put a nine-cylinder Thompson. Just a beautiful sounding engine, you know. With the power and, and the sound of that little sewing machine engine, it, it just was a beautiful thing to fly. Yes, the original Heath was a wire brace fuselage. That is, in between the bays, it was diagonally braced with wire. And he came up with a infinitely better and more practical fuselage. He was one of the first to have a door on the sides. 
He was the first one to use freeze-type ailerons. And he was the first that I know of ever to use brakes. He machined out his own drums and, and installed the whole doggone works. And they worked right off the bat. In the latter part of the 30s, the Northwest had a uh, gathering every year of home builders. And one of the big things was altitude. A sealed barograph would be placed aboard and you would climb until you couldn't climb no more. He, ran, he won that altitude contest three years consecutive. I got up over 18,000 feet with a 40 horse engine. No oxygen. I couldn't spell oxygen those days. We didn't know what oxygen was. I did notice he got forgetful. He got forgetful for a while. Got to thinking, what in the heck am I doing up here? And then I like to froze to death. I had a little drop of water froze on the bottom of my nose. I had a red spot there for years afterward. Oh, it was cold up there. I don't remember how long it took me to get there. I know it took a long time to get down. Because it hurt your ears. I think it took me 45 minutes to get up there. You know, I put a lot of responsibility on Walt Rubert. First of all, I knew him for a long while, and he was down there in the shop, and when new pilots would come in or somebody wanted a hangar or something that nature, I said, now, well, you check him out. You watch him. If he's not capable of getting into a small field or getting into this place, or he's a screwball why we haven't we will not have a hangar he was with me uh, close to 40 years 